1943 was beginning. Leningraders were surviving the second winter of the siege. The evacuation was practically complete, but people were still starving to death. The Wehrmacht command gave up active attacks to capture the city. The German reserves were sent to the south at the expense of their own troops, which were besieging Leningrad. The Red Army finally got an opportunity to lift the siege. Soviet command was preparing the Operation Iskra in order to restore the land's communication. Plotting the operational plan and the breakthrough itself would not be possible without the active work of regimental, divisional, artillery, aviation, and human intelligence. Reconnaissance men of all others were among the major heroes of breaking the blockade. It was January 1943. The Red Army was on its way to rescue Leningrad. Mstislav Ivanov, Pyotr Mikin, Shalom Skopis, and others in the reconnaissance scouts of the Liberator series. The main task of the intelligence is acquisition of information about the enemy. Defensive and offensive operations are planned, while its absence often causes defeat in a battle, which in its turn can affect the outcomes of war. Information about the counterforce and the plans are acquired by air and land intelligence, surveillance and listening surveillance services. It can come from the captives and line crossers. Communications intelligence and the net of secret agents are very active. Captured documents and hostile correspondence are studied. Every regiment had a reconnaissance platoon with about 40 people in it. It operated as a rule within the first defense zone of the enemy. And to get intelligence data, it could go up to 5 kilometers into the rear of the German. Each rifle division had a reconnaissance company. According to the Manning chart, there had to be 120 people in it, and it consisted of two platoons, foot mobile and cavalry intelligence. But the actual number of soldiers in the reconnaissance company was much smaller, as scouts died and were wounded more often as the regular infantry. Shalom Scopus, reconnaissance scout, recalls. Since the summer of 1943, there were never more than 50 people in our company. Out of the first makeup, just five to seven people still remained on duty by January 1945. Divisional intelligence had to go five to ten kilometers into the rear of the enemy, and during an offensive, up to 15 kilometers. The aim of the tactical reconnaissance is to determine the number of enemy penetrating force, the location of its military dispositions, identify the number of tanks, armored infantry carriers, guns, and machine guns. Sometimes key data could be found on a mere scrap of paper. Piotr Mikin recalls, It turned out that the prisoner we captured did not have any documents. The army headquarters demanded we got another prisoner. This was just as if it was a death sentence. I realized that the Germans would be waiting for us. Suddenly I remembered that I ordered one of the killed Germans to be searched and all his documents taken. The soldier who did this confessed. Yes, there was a scrap of paper. I lost it. Maybe it just slipped off when I was drying the smock. Everybody kneeled down and searched the clearing in the woods on their hands and knees, and we found a wrinkled piece of paper. This was a postal receipt. The German had sent a parcel, and there we could discern the number of the field post office. Judging by the number, the prisoner did not lie. He was actually from the Great Germany Division. An identification prisoner was not necessary. In autumn 1941, Germans approached Leningrad and captured a part of the southern shore of Lake Zdoga. They managed to capture just 12 kilometers of the coastline between Schlüsselburg and Worker Settlement No. 8. But these kilometers were enough to cut Leningrad from the continent for the entire two years. At the same time, the Finnish troops advanced along the eastern shore of the lake till the Sur River. Communication with Leningrad was performed by air or through Lake Ladoga, the siege started.
Since January 1942, the Soviets' command five times attempted to break this ring, but all to no effect. There were attempts made to break a corridor to the besieged Leningrad over the shortest 12-kilometer way, which was called Bottleneck. But the Germans turned this sector into a single defense center. All Soviet attacks got stuck in the intricate net of entrenchments and firing points. The attempt of the Second Strike Army to break through in circumvention of the enemy ended tragically. The army was entrapped and destroyed. In order to break through the robust German defense around Leningrad, one needed information about the location of the enemy defense works. The role of the reconnaissance during the preparation of the offensive operation was important more than ever. Scouts were usually selected from the infantry and trained at their detachments. As a rule, only volunteers were accepted. Vladimir Bukenko recalls, The voice of the buyer from the reconnaissance sounded, Well guys, it is make or break with us. It's hit or miss, but we do not feed lice in trenches. Any volunteers? Front and center. My comrade, Alexei Solodovnikov, and me decided. We might as well be hanged for a sheep as a lamb. We'd sell our lives dear. But the newcomers who chose to be scouts could only guess what hard combat work is expected of them. Leonid Kianazic recalls, When I volunteered for the reconnaissance, I did not quite understand what kind of frontline fate I had chosen. I just thought that this was the most honorable combat duty and I wanted to prove myself at the front line. Vladimir Zimakov got into the reconnaissance while getting back from hospital to his own detachment. Here comes some Jasper with a German submachine gun in German boots. Well, lads, what division are you from? 202? Ha! Huh, skedaddle division. Better come to us to the reconnaissance. No, 180. How's that? We're anti-tank riflemen. Oh, come on. You've had enough of these tanks. Join the reconnaissance. It's better there. Vladimir Bukenko recalls, There was no superiority in the old-timers' attitude. Moreover, they did their best to help the new soldiers in everything. One must take into account that scouts are a special caste. One has to be dead sure about one's comrade to accomplish a mission. But it was very hard for the newly appointed commanders to gain a good reputation. Mstislav Ivanov recalls, Our group is to go on a mission. Some young lieutenant from an intelligence school could be appointed commander. He knows everything in theory, but in practice he cannot do anything. We crawl onto the midground. Someone crawls up to him. Lieutenant, we do not want to die for nothing. That's why today this sergeant will be commander. When you come back, report that the mission was accomplished. Training of young reconnaissance scouts took from a week to a month, and only after they went on a mission. Evgeny Agapov recalls, The training was compulsory for everyone. For instance, they did not let me go on a mission for two weeks until I mastered the basics, which a scout needs. The newcomers were first of all trained in observation skills. It is important that a reconnaissance scout would not only look but see. A new soldier was shown various items lying on a table. Then the items were quickly covered and the soldier was asked to describe everything he had seen orally or in writing. The same training was done for oral memory. A number of sounds were reproduced. The click of a breech block, the sound of a pot, a round. The scout had to identify the sequence in which these sounds were reproduced. 
A very important skill was the ability to identify distance at night judging by the flash from a shot. As soon as the soldier saw a flash from a distant shot, he would count, and one, and two, and three. And if the sound of the shot was heard in three seconds, then by multiplying three by 340, the soldier calculated the distance to the firing point, 1,020 meters. There were other figures which helped identify the distance to the source of the sound. Usual speech of one person is heard over the distance of 100 meters. Speech in low voice is heard over the distance of 90 meters. Commands and shouting, up to 1,000 meters. Whispering, 60 meters. A cough, 40 meters. Footfall sound, 30 meters. Crawling, 16 meters. Truck engine running, within 300 to 500 meters. The scout learned techniques of hand-to-hand -hand combat and learned to wield a knife. Those who engaged in combat sports before for the war, boxing or wrestling, also found themselves in the reconnaissance company. Alexander Solovyov recalls, They taught us to strike underarm. This is more dangerous. The instructor used to say, even if you fall, you could strike him underarm. The newcomers were taught to crawl and overcome obstacles without a sound. We drilled carrying off sentries who were played by scouts themselves while training. Leonid Kniasik recalls, When during practice you were appointed a German sentry, the feeling was far from agreeable. Soldiers learned how to fire various guns, most often handguns and submachine guns. They were not trained to deactivate mines. Sappers were assigned to the groups for mine disposal. After primary training, the newcomers went on a mission in groups consisting of experienced soldiers. And only during first reconnaissance operations, or, as they said, search, it was clear what every one of them could do, and what tasks they could accomplish. Mr. Slav Ivanov recalls, The main thing is psychological stability. A good scout should not panic even in the most challenging situation. He must get accustomed to the fact that he could be killed at any moment. If you think how to survive, you are not reliable anymore. Troops of the Leningrad and Volkov fronts prepared for Operation Iskra. Its plan envisaged that simultaneous counterblows from both fronts would clear the Ladoga shoreline from the German forces. The territory was defended by the German group of troops equal approximately to six infantry divisions and possessing about 700 guns and mortars. To counter these forces, the command of the Leningrad and Volkov fronts concentrated 20 rifle divisions as well as seven rifle three ski and five tank brigades. The troops had 4,600 guns and mortars and about 500 tanks. The numerical superiority over the enemy was, in the infantry, 4.5 fold, artillery, 6 to 7 fold, and tanks, 10 fold. The beginning of the operation was scheduled January 1st, 1943, but because of bad weather conditions, it was transferred to January 12th. The troops of both fronts had to advance only 12 kilometers, but the Germans turned these kilometers along never-freezing marshes and peat mines into virtually an unassailable fortress. The reconnaissance had to uncover the defense system of this fortress. The enemy's defense was under permanent surveillance. For this end, fire units furnished a whole system of observation points at the battlefront, from where reconnaissance scouts observed the terrain in shifts. 
Most often a trench or a small dugout were used as an observation point. As a rule, it was not big, about two by two meters. Its height, no more than one meter, only allowed the soldier to stay in reclining posture. For camouflage security, it was not possible to construct a high headwork. Besides, materials were scarce for that. The ceiling of a dugout is made of wooden boards, straw, and soil. The door was made of martial cloak, which during the day was tucked up to let in some light. At night, the so-called telephone illumination was used. A piece of PTF-7 telephone cable was hanged on the pegs, which were knocked into the walls of the dugout all around its perimeter. This cable had a cotton sleeving soaked with a zocorite resin. In the evening, the cable was set on fire from one end and its burns producing a dim, smoking flame. In the morning, the hands, faces, and clothes of the scouts were black with smoke, but they could rarely come into possession of captured candles. To cover the observation point from the enemy, any movement around it during daytime were prohibited. That is why food was brought to the scouts twice a day, before dawn and after dark. Observation point could also be equipped on a tree, but it was not always convenient to keep surveillance from a tree. In windy weather, when the tree is swaying back and forth, you can easily be mistaken when determining the distance to the target. But the scouts had their own stratagem. Vasily Blinkov recalls, We put two or three poles into the earth and high above the ground, tied three of these posts with a rope. Only the treetop would sway if the tree is on leash. It would be much more convenient to observe and the data would be more accurate. Scouts had to know how to use a binocular telescope, binoculars, and a rasvetchik, meaning scout in Russian, periscope. While observing, they kept records of movement and the enemy's positions, new or abandoned firing positions, hostile observation points, and the arrangement of German entrenchments. Often Germans were employing stratagems to trick observation scouts. They put glass splinters on hill slopes. Their glistening looked like the glistening of a binocular telescope or binoculars. A beginner could mark this spot as an observation point of the enemy, but it was hard to deceive an experienced soldier. Sun glints from scattered glass are static while glistening of the glass of binoculars or binocular telescopes move from time to time. In order to mislead the enemy and mask the location of the troops, Germans often deliberately fired furnaces in abandoned dugouts with damp peat, which gave much smoke, but experienced scouts knew that dugouts occupied by soldiers were heated only with dry wood and only at night. In order to reveal the fire system of the enemy, just before the offensive, an intelligence gathering operation was arranged. The documents captured during such operations, lists of units, orders and instructions, call sign tables, allowing to identify the defense system, the number and the intentions of the enemy at the regiment or division scale. Such information was only valuable for one or two days, but it was indispensable before an offensive. Thorough surveillance of the enemy was undertaken before the intelligence gathering operation started. Apart from reconnaissance scouts, also rifle units were engaged in this operation. Nikolai Kvatkin recalls, We kept out of the infantry's way, because we, 25 people, could do more than 100 infantrymen. We could break into a trench and leave very quickly. No world champion could catch up with them. The infantry initiated combat. In the meanwhile, the scouts breached passages in the wire entanglement under supporting artillery fire and mortars. The seizure party broke into the trench by a sudden advance and raced back with the captured prisoner and documents. 
The covering party suppressed the firing points of the Germans with fire and also retreated behind. The infantry warned by rocket signals about the accomplished mission also returned to the original positions. During this short combat, commanders and artillery observers located the hostile firing points and marked them on maps. During preparation to the offensive, these points were destroyed first of all. Certainly, there were casualties during such fights. Nikolai Kovatkin recalls. There never was without casualties, especially in the covering party. The Germans pursued us. The covering parties came last, shooting back. They tried to shoot the Germans and let the seizure party leave. When planning the offensive, commanders had to know for sure the situation both at the battlefront and in the deep defense of the enemy. In this case, the prisoner had to be taken not from trenches in the battlefield, but from the rear. To do this, reconnaissance search was organized. This was most often performed when it was dark. Before the raid, experienced scouts selected a spot where the reconnaissance group would penetrate the German rear. Alexander Solovyov recalls. Four went to the forefront and selected a place for crossing. If they did not, the next night they went to another sector. The point for the sally was selected very carefully. And if the Germans noticed us, then off with it. We did not even come closer. Before the mission, the scouts divided into three groups, a mission support group, a seizure party, and a covering party. The mission support group, which usually consisted of two to four sappers, was assigned with the task of arranging a passage in the defense zone. They had to work their way through German minefields and wire entanglements. They had to know their own tricks and secrets too. Pavel Borisov recalls. It's better when two people cut the wire. One cuts it, and the other holds it with his hands, so that the wire does not clink. German wire when cut coils into a circle and makes such noise that is heard at the enemy's posts. It should not be allowed. That is why, when the wire's cut, the other scout carefully sticks its ends into the ground, so that they cannot hinder the crawling soldiers. Germans often installed near their position a full system of simple but efficient alarms. These could be very simple arrangements of empty cans, which rumbled when one caught them or when one cut wire. In response to the noise, in the darkness a German machine gun burst came. That's why one had to be very particular when cutting a wire. Usually only two bottom wires were cut to let a man crawl through. When it was heard that the seizure party began its operation in the German entrenchment, the sappers cut the other wires and waited for the scouts' return. The seizure group consisted of soldiers who directly performed reconnaissance search at the hostile territory. As a rule, these were experienced, skillful, and physically fit scouts. Alexander Solovyov recalls. Our seizure group was four Herculeses. One could see they were either athletes once, or I saw what they were up to during practice and, and how they threw each other. Very strong and skillful. In regimental reconnaissance, the seizure company usually consisted of three to five persons. Only two of them went on a mission. All five participated in operations only when accomplishing very challenging missions. For example, intercepting a motorcyclist or taking an identification prisoner from the headquarters. The covering party had to cut the enemy by fire while the seizure party was leaving if it was discovered. The soldiers from the covering party also had to carry out the dead or wounded comrades. Never leaving friends to the enemy was an ironclad rule of the reconnaissance. It was the covering party where most scouts began their service. Vladimir Bukenko recalls, The young started with the covering party. They still had to gain experience in order to be in the seizure party. 
Nikolai Chernoff recalls, The soldiers sometimes refused to go on a mission if they were overwhelmed with the premonition of death. If a scout could not go, I did not force him. I never forced anyone, and always asked, Guys, who goes today? And formed a group of those willing. They went on missions in regular uniform, without insignias. A camouflage cloak was also worn on top of the uniform. Documents and awards were left behind so that the enemy could not get any information even from personal belongings. The commander took with him the so-called blind map, which had no marks at all, and capturing a scout alive was almost impossible. Evgeny Agapov recalls, even a wounded scout in a desperate situation would shoot himself dead. The people who served in reconnaissance were mostly those who did not fear anything at all anymore. Before mission, the ammunition was checked very thoroughly. The covering party, as often as not, was armed with submachine guns. Sometimes they took a light machine gun, and the seizure party armed, depending on the situation, only with handguns and knives, or they could also have a submachine gun. A heavy and cumbersome PPSH, Spagen machine gun, was not well suited for reconnaissance search. That's why many preferred German MP40 machine guns. Mikhail Schinder recalls, the next day after my arrival at the platoon, one of the scouts took a German submachine gun and three magazine cases from his rucksack and looking sideways at the PPSH, he said, take this lieutenant, the Nazi one is not so heavy. To the moment of breaking the blockade, the first PPS Sudaev machine gun started to appear in the Soviet reconnaissance. The PPS submachine gun designed by Alexei Sudei was well respected by many scouts. During reconnaissance search, it is very important for a gun to be light and compact. The PPS, which weighed just 3 kilos, outdid not only the legendary PPSH, but also the German MP3040 machine gun, which was one kilometer heavier than the Sudai, and the noiselessness of the scouts' movements directly depended on the weight of their arms. Evgeny Agapov recalls, The scouts of a seizure party mostly went on missions only with the PPS, a handgun and a stealth knife. A PPS submachine gun was less cumbersome than a PPSH and more suited for reconnaissance. Alexei Sudaev designed this machine gun in 1942 in the harsh conditions of the besieged Leningrad. Many experts and veterans recognized PPS as the best submachine gun of World War II. Apart from being compact, it is handy and features quite good performance characteristics for a submachine gun. The submachine gun had a folding stock and a snail-type magazine for 35 cartridge rounds. The PPSH, for its high rate of fire, was sometimes called the cartridge eater, and PPS's rate of fire was half as much. That is why soldiers could deliver fire in short bursts without changing the magazine. The bullet released from a PPS preserved its kill potential up to 800 meters, while the German MP40 was only effective in close combat when the distance was up to 150 meters. Ivan Morozov recalls, Sudaev machine gun was also good because you could fire both with the stock folded and unfolded. It was still good. It was anyway convenient. Firepower sufficient for a reconnaissance scout. The only thing I missed was the fire control lever to switch to single fire. But we learned to fire short bursts of five to six shots. We also could fire single shots after all. To do this, we must take the finger off the trigger once you push it. But usually we did not need to deliver single Single fire. Both PPS and PPSH were more reliable and less sensitive to dirt than the German MP40. Alexander Slutsky recalls, We did not use German submachine guns. They were not considered reliable at our detachment and were not respected. Still, some scouts preferred the MP40 but it was more readily available because of their personal liking. 
Batch production of PPS submachine guns started as early as in 1942. Its manufacture was simple and cheap, which was particularly important in the conditions of a dragged out war. It was almost completely assembled from molded parts. It was bonded by welding or clinching. The material consumption for the PPS was three times less than for the PPSH. Material consumption for one PPS was three times less than for one PPSH. In 1943, Sudaev improved his weapon, removed minor shortcomings, and simplified some structural components, which made manufacture even cheaper. All in all, during the war, about half a million PPS submachine guns of both versions were produced. Captured PPS-43 submachine guns were highly valued, even in the German army, where they were converted and used as MP-719R. For two days, the scouts were surveying the enemy's battlefront, selecting the least guarded spot. They decided to go through a small wallow, which was as if cutting the German defense into two parts. It was guarded by two rows of barbed wire, a minefield, and two fortified emplacements. The group of ten scouts was led by the commander of the regimental reconnaissance platoon. In the night, the scouts went out to the midground. Sappers were crawling first. Suddenly, one of them stumbled upon a thin signal wire of the primitive German alarm system. You just cut it, and an empty can tied to the other end of this wire will fall, rumbling in the fortified emplacement. The gunner would jump up to his machine gun and will fire at the registered spot. While two sappers were holding the wire, the third cut it. Then, they fastened the loose ends. They wrapped them around the stakes of the wire entanglements. A winter night is long. After several hours, the scouts having breached through the entanglements and the minefield, crawled to the hostile territory. The sappers stayed to wait at the passage. Having walked half a kilometer, the reconnaissance group approached the road. Along it, on poles, a telephone cable was laid. The seizure party crawled to the telephone cable, and one of the scouts cut it. They only had to wait for the German signal men to appear. Soon the scouts saw silhouettes of two German soldiers, a flashlight thrust, one signal man is killed, and the scout grabbed the other by his throat. A short question in German, do you want to live? The German nodded his head. Urging a German in front of them, the scouts return to the place where their comrades await them. Crouching, all run to the passage. First, the German. Then, the seizure party. And last, the mission support group. Near the wire, everyone lied down. The sappers again move first. After the entanglements, the group jump up and race to their trenches. But the Germans notice them. The trench flare went up into the sky. The mortars opened fire, attempting to cut the scouts from their entrenchment. Too late. Having lost no one, the group tumbles into the first trench of their troops. The mission is accomplished. The night before January 12th, based on the intelligence data, the composite group of night bombers of the Volkov Front attacked the hostile artillery positions and command points in the penetration area. At the same time, Soviet aircraft attacked the air facilities and railway junctures in the rear of the German army. In this way, the German forces around the bottleneck were isolated from the main body. The German command did not manage to transport reserves by railroad to the penetration area. On January 12th at 9.30 a.m., artillery preparation started at the sectors where the offensive was to begin. Forty minutes before the attack, the ground attack air force in groups of six to eight aircraft attacked communication centers, artillery and mortar batteries. Covered by the barrage artillery fire, the Soviet shock troops began the assault of the German positions. The troops of the first echelon of the Leningrad Front, having crossed the Nieva by ice, broke down the resistance of the Germans between the second town and Schlüsselburg, and by the end of the day they moved on for three kilometers. The second shock army of the Volkov Front also went on to the offensive and advanced deep into the German defense.
On January 13th, the offensive continued. By the end of January 14th, the distance between the troops of the Leningrad and Volkov fronts was no more than two kilometers. The German forces, which were staying around Schlüsselburg and Lipki, were almost fully isolated from the main forces. During the following three days, the Soviet troops, with increasing attack power, continued their offensive in an effort to complete the breakthrough and meet near worker settlements number one and number five. The main events were unfolding in the morning of January 18th, when the forces of the two fronts finally met. Between Leningrad and the continent, a narrow corridor was broken through which allowed to arrange for food supplies and fuel to the city. This was to a great extent thanks to the Soviet frontline reconnaissance. Reconnaissance operations were not always successful. Oleg Kupetsky recalls. We used to say R-I-F-R-R, -R, reveal, illuminate, fire, retreat, rest. When something of the kind happened, the commander was disgusted. You should go on the four seas. Come capture carry corrals. The search was continued until they managed to get an identification prisoner. And this was not the worst thing after all. Mikhail Kosh recalls. In the regiment which stayed next to ours, the commander, outraged by the failure of the reconnaissance scouts, ordered, You haven't captured one at night. Go and capture one in broad day. And so they went to their glory. Alexander Slutsky recalls, In the company itself, the discipline was cast iron. But outside, we could afford some deviations with the Army Bible, especially after some successful missions, when our squad had gained a very good reputation and we were trusted a lot. In particular, scouts could indulge in drinking and good food. There were never actually any problems with food supplies in the reconnaissance detachments, even during battles near Leningrad. Vladimir Bukenko recalls, We never used to complain about food. We always went first, so we always had our spoils of war. We captured German railroad cars, trucks with food supplies, and handed them over to our sergeant major. We would sometimes even feed the infantry. Besides, the Germans, whom we took prisoner, almost always had flasks with alcohol with them. So the scouts had something to add to the front line 100 grams. Because of this, many people called them aristocrats, but scouts paid a very high price for their aristocracy, as they died more often than the infantrymen. Leonid Knyazik recalls, Not one of us believed we would survive. Take for instance, the three of us, first, Bikov died. Then I was wounded for the second time. Here I am in the hospital, and Efremov is brought to the hospital too. And would the war continue for a little bit longer, or if I had not been acknowledged invalid, I would surely have been killed. To survive a scout as no one else, apart from dexterity, strength, training and experience, needed luck and good comrades, ready to die for each other, and they could be real friends, and they also protected each other.
Cal Cinder recalls, I so much wanted Vanya Shavakulov to be safe. I sent him on reconnaissance missions rarely. He had received a letter from his mother. It said Ivan's wife had died. She had been starving, had given all her food to the children and died very young. Then I first saw him crying. After our last battle on May 2nd in Berlin, Ivan asked me, Why haven't you sent me on missions as the others? And I said to him, We are almost all single. If we get killed, our mother will cry and calm down. But you have two children. Who would raise them if not you? And then I saw tears on his face again. January 18th, the troops of the two fronts met near Workers' Settlement No. 1 and 5. Schisselberg was liberated, and the shore of Lake Ladoga was cleared from the enemy. The 8 to 11 kilometer wide corridor along the shore restored land communication between Leningrad and the country. And finally something happened, for which the defenders of Leningrad had been dreaming. Something for which they had been fighting. Later, the Volkov drinking song was composed. It was about these people. Let's drink to those who led their squads, who died on the snow, who cut their way through bogs to Leningrad, breaking enemy's neck. Sean Scopus recalls, I used to carry my first award, Medal for Bravery, as a good luck charm to reconnaissance search with me in a pocket of my blouse. Although we were supposed to hand awards to Sergeant Major, it saved me from 100% death. A frag of the grenade which was headed right into my heart, mutilated the metal, tore a piece of the metal and after changing its trajectory, hit my lung. There, this frag stays till the present day. Medal for Bravery was established back in 1938. The statue of the medal gives all military categories of the Red and, afterwards, the Soviet Army, who could be awarded with it. Among the first who received the medal for personal courage and bravery in protecting their motherland and performing a soldier's duty were frontier sentries, Gulyaev and Grigoryev, who caught a group of raiders near Lake Kazan. Since the moment it appeared, and until the disintegration of the Soviet Union Medal for Bravery, was considered the most highly respected medal in the country, Vladimir Zimikov recalls. At the end of the war, I received my Medal for Bravery for the brewed-up armored infantry carrier. In fact, for a brewed-up tank, one was supposed to get 500 rubles and the Order of the Red Star. But the first and the best award is the Medal for Bravery, and only after it, the Order of Glory. During the war, Medal for Bravery was awarded to more than 4,230,000 soldiers. A mortar gunner of the 8th Independent Guards Rifle Brigade, Sergeant Stepan Mikonovich Zolnikov, was five times awarded with the Medal for Bravery during the war. Larissa Petrovna Moiseva came to the front as a medical assistant and finished war as a communications telephone operator of the 824th Independent Reconnaissance Artillery Battalion. During the war, she was three times awarded with the Medal for Bravery. Matvai Gershman recalls, Certainly the Order of Glory or the Medal for Bravery on the chest are like a trademark or a quality seal of the active war participant, but there were thousands of soldiers and officers who were invalided from the army because of a wound, those who did not receive any awards. During the first years of the war, awards were rare. To prevent the advance of Germans to Lake Ladoga again, the Soviet troops went out to the offensive by a newly laid narrow-gauge railroad, which was continually under fire. Food and fuel were supplied to the city. The lives of many people of Leningrad were saved. They were saved to a great extent due to the well-consolidated, exhausting, everyday work of the Soviet scouts. Shalom Skopis recalls, Scouts and raiders are the only people who spent the entire war face to face with the enemy and death. And any thriller would seem a heart comedy 
after a scout sincerely tells you about what he had to see and experience while in the reconnaissance. After all, we often had to slaughter Germans with knives or strangle them instead of just killing them with the submachine gun. You just think, well, what is meant by I carried off a sentry? Or we neutralized guard without a noise? Just ask scouts what nightmares they still have at night. The war was raging on. Day and night in any weather, scouts did their risky work providing the command with intelligence about the enemy. The, the lifting of the siege of Leningrad in January 1944 was in a whole year to come, and there was still two and a half years until the end of the war.